Maranatha, my loved ones, and welcome to another presentation of our Prophecy Seminar, Unveiling Revelation, Your Life is About to Change Forever. Today we have another fascinating study as we go into uh, the question of how do we worship God as our Creator. And so before we, get, we, we, but before we start, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity. We thank you for the blessings. We thank you for the guidance and the love. And we ask, Father, that you may uh, give us understanding in the sermon to not only understand your word, but to also to live by it. So we thank you, Father, for this blessing, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we've been studying recently, we've been studying off of this uh, everlasting gospel in Revelation chapter 14. So I would like you to join me, please, as we go to Revelation chapter 14. We've been studying what is known as the, the three angels message, right? The last warning, God's last call to the earth. And we're still working on that first angel, but let's do a quick review before we get into our study today. So Revelation chapter 14, go with me please, verse number 6. Revelation chapter 14, verse number 6. And it says like this. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Now, we talked about this everlasting gospel, right? The everlasting good news. And we said that the everlasting gospel is the plan of salvation. And what is the plan of salvation? The plan of salvation is that Humanity may dwell again in the presence of divinity, right? Why is it that we cannot dwell in the presence of God? Right now, it's because of sin, right? So the plan of salvation is to solve the problem of sin. And we know that where is the plan of salvation? Where is that process of reconciliation with God explained or detailed? It's in the sanctuary, right? The sanctuary breaks down the steps, the details, the pattern of which we then would, should follow, following the steps of Jesus Christ, who through the sanctuary is then giving out and carrying out this plan of salvation, not on the earthly sanctuary like in the old covenant, but in the heavenly sanctuary in the new covenant. And so that is the everlasting gospel. That is the plan of salvation. And so I say praise the Lord for that. And we talked a little bit also about the, the plan of salvation has three dimensions, right? The three dimensions is not only the forgiveness of sins, but it's also victory over sin, amen? So God wants to forgive us our sins first, and through that process of forgiveness, then he then cleanses us from our sins, right? Justification, sanctification, justification, sanctification is the process over which uh, justification is founded on, right? So justification is the foundation, sanctification is then having on the platform of justification where we are being cleansed from our sins, we are giving victory over sin, and of course, the last dimension of the plan of salvation is the elimination or eradication of sin from this world and this universe forever. Amen. That's the full plan of salvation. That's the full gospel as it's explained in detail and broken down in the sanctuary. Now, remember, this gospel is going to be preached to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. That means every single human being on earth before the end of this world is going to listen, is going to hear this everlasting gospel. And that's Parallel to Revelation chapter, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, when Jesus says that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to all the world, right? To all nations by, through your testimony, and then the end shall come. So that's why we're studying it. That's why this is so important, this, the three angels message, because this is the last warning. This is the last message to earth before the end comes. Verse number seven, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made or who created the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. So we've gone through these three, the first three points, right? Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. Fear God is what? Is to reverence God, is to honor God, is to obey God, is to keep his commandments, right? It's, it's a re representation of of seeing the glory of God, of seeing the mercy and the love of God that should give us to a sense of awe in the presence of God, right? Give glory to him. We talked about the, the way that we give glory to him is when we reflect his character. When people see the character of Christ, Christ in us, when our character is being transformed, renewed, restored back into the image of Christ, then, my loved ones, we are giving honor and glory to him through that example, and the hour of his judgment has begun. As we studied in our previous presentation, judgment has begun not in the, uh, in the most holy place in the earthly sanctuary, but in the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary as we studied. And so today we're going to talk about this last point 
Um, worship him who made or created the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Now, if we're being asked to worship God as the creator of the, the seas, the waters, and everything, that implies that we are not giving him the worship that he deserves because of being the creator, right? Because that's what it's asking us. This first angel's message is a call to restore these four principles that have been forgotten. And so if he's at, again, if we're being asked to worship God as the creator of the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water, that implies that we're not doing it. And so we're being asked to do this before the end comes. Now, is God worshiped as the creator? Well, let's look at a couple of verses. Let's look at Acts chapter 4, verse 24. And it says, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made what? Heaven, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. So the early church, right, in Acts, was worshiping God as what? As the creator of the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Amen? Now, how about in heaven? Do you think that they worship God as the creator in heaven? Let's look at another verse. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. It says, Worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. Why? Why is God worthy to receive glory, honor, and power? It says very simply here, for you created what? All things, and by your will they exist and were created. So in heaven, God is worshipped as the creator. Here on earth, God, the early church, God was being worshipped as a creator. But it seems that in the end times, the message is worship God as the creator. Why? Because we have forgotten that very point. And so God is asking us to restore the worship that identifies or points to him as our creator. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to thank God for creation. Amen? I, even despite the pains and the tribulations and the difficulties and the struggles in this, in this life, listen, I want to thank God for this life, and especially because we know that there's a better life, right? There's a new heavens and a new earth that God is going to prepare for those that love him and honor him. So let's get into this concept of worshiping God as the creator. Now, the first thing that we should ask ourselves is, how do we worship God as the creator, right? And so for that, the context of the question goes immediately where? To creation, right? It's saying worship him as the creator of the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs. So that means we need to go back to creation, right? Again, we need to go back to Genesis, which is the origins, the beginning of everything. As we explained already, if, you, if we're able to understand, especially the first three chapters of Genesis, the book of Genesis in general, but especially those first three chapters, everything else kind of falls into line with the plan of salvation. So let's go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And what does Genesis 1, verse 1 say? In the beginning, what happened in the beginning? God created the heavens and the earth. Notice, my loved ones, that the Bible does not start with a question, does not start with a doubt. The Bible starts with the declaration that God is the creator from the very beginning, right? From the beginning, before any of this existed, God was there and he created all things. Amen? Now, this is a question, a very interesting question that I get sometimes. When we talk about God as the creator, who are we talking about in regards to the Godhead, right? Because we have the three persons of the Godhead, which is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So when it says God is the creator, which of the three persons of the Godhead is it speaking about? Now, that's a trick question, right? Because when I ask this question, most people will say God the Father. Some people will say God the Son. Other people will say God the Holy Spirit. Now, in essence... All three of them are involved in creation, right? God the Father, the way I like to look at it is God the Father is like the, is like the architect. God the Son, Jesus Christ, he is the carpenter. And the Holy Spirit is the hammers and the nails, right? He is the, the uh, instrument that is going to be carrying out this creation. Of course, the angels are also involved, but that's in another sphere. And we'll be talking about that later on, especially when we talk about uh, some other topics in regards to creation. Now... Despite that, Scripture does point and does, re, uh, does give credit to specifically one of them in the context. Look at what it says in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? We know who the Word is. The Word is Christ. 
All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So it tells us very clearly here that Jesus Christ, the word, he was with God and he is God, right? But it tells and it te teaches that all things were made by him and nothing would not be here if it not were him. So technically giving is telling us that Jesus Christ is given credit as the creator. Now again, the father is also involved in creation, so is the Holy Spirit. But everything in scripture is pointing to Jesus Christ. Everything in scripture is trying to most, the father and the Holy Spirit are trying to point us in that direction in regards to creation. Now, being that we, are, we can call Jesus Christ creator, the question then is, how do we come to understand worshiping God as the creator, right? And for that, going back to Genesis, going back to the first chapter, we find in Genesis chapter 1, the sixth, uh, six days of creation, right? Very interesting six days of creation. And what happens? First day of creation, right? What was made? Well, the light, right? Let there be light, day number one. So let's think about Christ making this creation, uh, this, this, this creation picture, right? I, uh, I've learned this. I actually learned this from, uh, from Pastor Bohr, this example that I'm going to be sharing with you. Let's say Christ comes forth and he, and he presents this picture, right? This, this uh, canvas, right, as a, as a painter to understand the concept of creation. We'll use this concept of a painter and a canvas. So the earth is this canvas, this empty, void uh, uh, canvas, right, which it was at the beginning, as it says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. And so it says that on the first day, what did Christ do? Now, we're talking about Christ before he became Jesus in, in, in flesh, right? We're talking about uh, pre-incarnation. So he comes and he makes the first day, and the first day he creates light. That's it. He says that there be light, there, there's light. He's done the first day. Second day, what happens? Comes forth, and he says, let there be what? Let's separate the waters, right? Which way? The waters are separated vertically. And so by separating the waters vertically, what happens? Comes forth what? Comes forth the atmosphere, right? Where, what is the purpose of the atmosphere? So that we can breathe, right? Mmm, I enjoy breathing. I don't know about you, but I really enjoy breathing. That's it. He's done there. Comes back the third day. What does Christ say? He says, up, oh, let's separate the waters now horizontally. And so the waters are separated horizontally. And what comes forth? Dry land, mountains, right? Valleys, all of the beautiful landscape that we see. That's it. He's done. This is good. Every day he's saying, this is good. This is good. This is good. He finishes on the third day, fourth day. Christ comes back. And what does he do? He creates what? He creates the, the stars and, the, and the, uh, the planets, right? We're probably uh, under scientifically talking about those that are in our galaxy, right? Those that we can see with the, with the, with the human eye. And so he creates the sun, the stars, the moon, right? And what does he say? Good. And he leaves. Comes back the fifth day. Continuing to build on creation. And if you notice, creation is, is going from, uh, from is, is, is growing in complexity, right? It's growing in, in, in complexity and also, if you kind of notice, in importance as well. And so on the fifth day, Christ comes up and he says what? Oh, today I'm going to create the animals. The, which animals? The animals in the ocean, in the waters, in the rivers, and the animals in the air, right? So you have the eagle and the hummingbird and you have the, uh, the, the animals and dolphins and whales and all of these majestic, beautiful animals. And he says, what? It is good. That was on the fifth day. But then comes the sixth day and something different happens on the sixth day. Let's read it. On the sixth day, God does something very, very special. Christ says what on the sixth day? Uh, um, verse number, well, we can read the whole, the whole, almost the whole thing. Let's look at it here from verse number uh, 24. Genesis 1, 24. Then God said, let the earth bring forth the living creatures according to its kind, cattle and creeping things and the beast of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind. Then it says in verse number 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Notice how there is our, let us, us make man, right? That concept of God, Elohim in Genesis is pluralistic, right? God has a, a singular nature in the sense of God is one. The concept of Echab, right? A unit, 
but also this pluralistic nature where you have the three persons of the Godhead. And it says, let us, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are in counsel, make man in our image according to our likeness, right? And so God, it says in verse 27, God created man in his own image and in the image of God, he created man and female. And we talked about that image or in the reflection of the character of God, right? There's also some type of physical uh, re reflection as well, but that's a little bit more uh, complex. And no notice what it says in verse number uh, 26 we were reading. And let them have dominion over what? Over the fish, over the sea, over the birds, over the cattle, over the, all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So everything that was created in those, in those six days before God created man was for what? Was as a gift to, God, to Adam and Eve, right? Actually, the earth is the gift. It's the wedding gift that God gives Adam and Eve after he creates them. But then it says very interestingly on verse number 31, after all of this was created, it says, Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were what? Were the sixth day. So technically God finished creating everything on the sixth day. Christ said on the sixth day, it is what? It is very good, right? Everything was very good indeed. Why? Because everything needed was created within those six days. Everything that man, after creating Adam and Eve, everything that they needed to live, to exist, to eat, to be happy, to be plentiful, to be joyful, it was all created on the sixth day. But notice what it says in chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth and the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all the work which he had done, then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all the work which God had created and made. So it's interesting because it says that he finished creating on the sixth day. He said it is very good, right? First five days, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. On the seventh, sixth day, he says it is very good. And it says that he finished creating everything on the sixth day. But then it says in chapter two that everything was finished on the seventh day, right? So this apparent contradiction uh, is, is very interesting. Now, again, remember, we talked about the fact that the Bible does not contradict itself. Why? Because the Bible comes from the mind of God. And so when there are apparent contradictions, what we want to do is we want to go deeper into our study to make sure that we're understanding and we're interpreting Scripture correctly. Now, how could we understand this? Again, we, if we look at it through the eyes of a painter, it is very clear. When a painter, when an artist has their canvas and they're painting and drawing, let's say for six days, they're completing their painting and they finish drawing everything, right? Like, like the portrait of creation. Everything was finished on the sixth day, but it says that on the seventh day, everything was created also. Why? Because technically on the sixth day, everything that Adam and Eve needed to live was, was created. Everything that was on that portrait needed on that painting for, for humanity to live and to sustain itself was done. But there was one thing missing on the portrait of creation. And what was that one thing missing? It was the signature, right? A, point, a painter, an artist will always put their signature, their sign, right? Their seal that points to them as the, creation, the creator or the painter of that piece of art. In the same way, my loved ones, when we look at creation, God did what? God created a seventh day. What is the purpose of the seventh day? The seventh day is the seal that God has placed on creation that identifies him as the creator. So when Christ created that seventh day, that seventh period of 24 hours, the purpose was nothing was created on that day, just a space of time with what reason or what purpose? that we would then take that day to notice and recognize and celebrate that God is the creator of all the previous six days, that he, that he is the creator of everything. And so that seventh day was a way to celebrate, to honor, to recognize and say, God, thank you for being our creator. We want to enjoy, we want to worship and give you glory. Doesn't mean we don't worship God on all the other seven, six days. But the seventh day is that special day that God said, it said he rested, he ceased, he Shabbat, right? He stopped creating, why? Because he took a time of rest to be able to celebrate and enjoy the time with him. So the Sabbath day then is, that sixth day, the seventh day of the week is that signature Right, The seal that God has placed on creation to point to him as the creator. Now, that sounds nice and dandy. 
And some people always say, oh, you're saying that because you're a very slick speaker. You're so slick, right? You think you have this, all this down. Well, remember, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what I think, what I believe, what I was taught. What matters is what I can prove through Scripture. And so is this true, what I am saying? Well, let's, let's go look at it. Go with me to Genesis chapter 20. I'm sorry, Exodus chapter 20, please. Exodus chapter 20, we're going to confirm what I just said, that the seventh day, the Sabbath day was what? Was created with the purpose of honoring and celebrating that God is our creator. Go with me to Exodus chapter 20, and let's look at this principle. In Exodus chapter 20, we have the Ten Commandments. Exodus 28. And let's begin. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it what? Holy. Let's take a stop here. What did, what did God say about the Sabbath day? To keep it holy, right? Holy. What does it mean to be holy? Holy means something that is different, that is separate, that is apart. God, for example, is holy because God is what? God is divine, right? We are not divine. Though there's a separation between God who is divine and his creator. God is holy. Now, those that affiliate with God, of course, then also participate of that holiness, not of our own nature, but of God's nature. But God is holy, and so anything that is dedicated to God is to be separated from the rest, right? You have what's common, and you have what's holy. You have what's clean, you have what's unclean. And so God is telling us, these things that are, uh, when I say something is holy, is that they're separate. So immediately it's telling us that this, the Sabbath day is holy, is distinct from what? From the other six days. Let's continue to read. Verse 9. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of Carlos Munoz. No, my loved ones, that's not what it says here. It says here that the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. So who does the seventh day belong to based on what we're reading? It belongs to God. In other words, he says, listen, I'm creating six days. Six days belong to you. You can do whatever you want on those six days, technically in, the, in, in the, the, the limitations that we have. But the seventh day, God says, now that's my day. That's the day that I have created with the purpose of celebrating the other six days of creation and that I am your creator and that you are my creation. I want to celebrate with you. I want to have that special quality time. It says, in it you shall do no work. Nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. So notice this. God says, listen, because this seventh day is holy, because it's separate, because I created it as a commemoration and a celebration of creation and that I am your God and you are my creation, I don't want you to do any work on that day. In other words, God is telling us, I don't want you to do work I don't want you to do uh, schoolwork. I don't want you to do the cleaning. I don't want you to do yard work. I don't want you to wash the car. Anything that is daily, that is uh, ordinary, that you can do on any of the other six days. God says, you got six days to do those things. The seventh day is a day that I don't want you to do the regular routine things that you do in your life. Now, the question is why? Why is God asking us, why is God asking me when I'm studying this in, my, in the first time, why is God asking me to take that seventh day, which is holy, and to separate it from the other six days and not do the same thing I would do on those six days? Here's the explanation. In verse number 11, it says it very clearly. For in six days the Lord made or created the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day, therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it or made it holy. My loved ones, this is exactly what the point I was making at the beginning, right? It says very clearly here, God says, listen, the seventh day is my holy day. The Sabbath day belongs to me. I don't want you to treat it like any other day. And why, what purpose or with what reason? Because it is celebration that I created everything in six days, right? And so he rested on the seventh day. And so remember, it's God's day. It's his Sabbath day. And what he does is he invites us into his rest on that day. He invites us to put aside our daily uh, works, our daily uh, occupations. And he says, put that aside. The seventh day is a holy celebration. It's a convocation to celebrate that I am your God and that you are my children. And you know what? I say amen to that. Does, I have a question. Does God still deserve to be honored as the creator of heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water, and everything that we see. I say yes. There's no reason to stop worshiping God as the creator. Amen? And so, that's what the Sabbath day is about. 
It's that special unique day where we're separating and dedicating it completely to God as our creator. It's his day. He's waiting for us to come into his rest with him on that day. And so I say praise the Lord for that. Now, the question is, why did God have to rest on the seventh day? As we talked about, right, when, when we were going through the creation week, Christ said, let there be light. And there was light. Let there be the firmament. Let there be the, I mean, let there be, it there doesn't take a lot. And every day he just spoke and it was created. So it's not a concept of being tired, right? Of being exhausted. God is like, after he created the, I don't know, the elephant, he's like, oh, that elephant just, just took the juice out of me, right? I need to rest. No. It says the Bible says that God does not get tired in any way, shape, or form. Now, the question then is, why did God create the Sabbath day? Well, Jesus explains it very clearly in Mark chapter 2, verse 27 and 28. Look at what it says. And Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for man. Now, let's stop there for a second. The word man in the Greek is the word anthropos. And the word anthropos means humanity, right? It's the where we get anthropology. And so it doesn't say that the Sabbath was made for the Jew, it says that the Sabbath was made for man. And now why we say that? Because the Jews don't show up until the end of Genesis after 12 tribes. Many people say the Sabbath is for the Jews. Well, I'm sorry, but the Bible does not say that. The Bible says, Jesus says it was created for humanity. And when was it created? In the very beginning. In Genesis chapter 1 and 2, it explains it very there. Let's go back to the quote. And so it says, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So... The Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. We basically read the first part, right? Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. And we'll talk a little bit about that for, further on. But it says that the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. What does that mean? It's because remember, the, the, uh, the Pharisees, the rabbis, the leaders, the religious leaders had made a burden of the Sabbath day after the slavery that had occurred when B Babylon destroyed Jerusalem. And so after that destruction, they made up and they came up with all of these extra uh, human laws in regards to how to keep the Sabbath, right? And it became a burden. And so when Jesus shows up, if you notice during Scripture, during the four Gospels, the Sabbath is a very consistent theme of debate. And the reason is because they're following these human-made traditions and Jesus comes along and is trying to show them, listen, I am the Lord of the Sabbath because I created the Sabbath day, right? So I am here to show you how to enjoy it. You're not enjoying it. You, it's become a burden to you. I want to show you what it means to keep the Sabbath day and how to keep it so that it can be a delight, it can be a joy for you. Amen? Now, the question is, what day is the Sabbath day? What day is the Sabbath day? And the reason I asked this, because I was not raised in a Christian home. And so when I come across this truth, I come across and I find that a number of people have different explanations to what day is the Sabbath day. Some people say that Sabbath is Sunday. Some people say that the Sabbath is Saturday. I have some people say that it's Friday. Some people say it's whatever day you want. And other people say there's no Sabbath day. It doesn't matter anymore. Now, that sounds very confusing to me, right? That sounds like confusion, and the concept of Babylon is talking about confusion. God is not a God of confusion. God is very clear in regards to what day is his Sabbath day. Now, there's a number of ways we can prove what day is a Sabbath day, but of course, the best way to do it is using Scripture. And so if you go with me, please, to Luke chapter 23, I want to show you what sealed the deal for me. We want to let the Bible tell us exactly what day is the Sabbath day. And there is no better example than Luke chapter 23 and 24. It is so clear as it explained here on what day is the Sabbath day. So in Luke chapter 23, if you start on verse number 50, for example, it talks about Jesus being buried, right? His body was on the cross. It says that Joseph of Arimathea came and he asked Pilate for the body and they took it down. And look at what it says in verse number 53. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen and laid it in the tomb that was hewed out of the rock where no one had ever laid before. Here's the key, verse 54. The day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew near. Now, Jesus Christ, we all know, based on the Christian customs, that he died what is known as Good Friday or the preparation day. Now, it says here that the Sabbath drew near, and that's a little bit tricky to understand because people say, wait a minute, how is the day drawing near, right? Because our concept of day comes from Western culture where the day will start at 
went at midnight, right? We learned that from the Romans. Day would start at midnight, but biblically and historically, the day does not start at midnight. Biblically and historically, the day starts when? When the sun sets, amen? So when the sun sets, that would be the beginning of the, the, of the next day. Now, I know it's a little tricky for us to understand, but really the dark part of the day is the first part of the day, and the clear part or the light part of the day is the second part of the day. That's why when you go to Genesis, it says it was, the, it was the evening and the morning, the first day. It was the evening and the morning, the first day, right? And so the concept of day begins with the sun setting. So in other words, we know that Jesus Christ was put on the cross at 9 o'clock in the morning based on the prophecy of when the lamb was sacrificed. And then we know that that finished at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And so Christ died on the cross at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So that's why it's saying that Christ was taken down, he was placed in the tomb, and it says it was the preparation day and the Sabbath drew near. Why? Because if you calculate from the time they bring his body down and they put him in the tomb, let's say it's 4 o'clock. And so if the sun is going to set around 6 o'clock, that means that the Sabbath was drawing near, the time was closing off. Now, let's continue to read. It says in verse number 55, And the woman who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid, right? That's the woman are Mary, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother, and all the Marys that were following Jesus. And it says 56, Then they returned, and they prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandments. So Mary and all the other Marys and all the women, they saw where they placed his body, and what did they do? They returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils. Why? Because all of this was an unexpected event, right? And they were not ready to, they were not ready to prepare the body of Christ for, uh, for his death, for his funeral. And so they go and prepare, but notice they do not return to prepare his body. Why? Because they rested on the Sabbath day according to the commandment. So obviously they did not have enough time, and what did they do? They stopped the work that they were doing in, in regards to the preparing of the anointments, and they rested according to the commandment. That is very important. Because what? Because these women knew that he was the Messiah. And they knew, my loved ones, that God is not contradicting himself. And they did what? They rested according to the Sabbath day. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Chapter 24, verse 1. Now, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came, the, the certain women, with the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. So now they're coming to anoint the body for burial. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And of course, why? Verse number six, the angel tells them he is not here, but he is risen. My loved ones, it says that the first day of the week, Jesus Christ, when they went to the tomb, what happened? He was resurrected. He had resurrected. Now, what day in Christianity is celebrated to, to celebrate the resurrection? It's called what? It's called Resurrection Sunday, the first day of the week. Now, I don't know about you, but I, this is the clearest, most direct evidence to what day is the Sabbath day. Preparation day, Friday, Good Friday when he dies, right? Six o'clock, the sun sets. It says they start to keep the Sabbath day. And then what happens? The next day on the first day of the week, which is the first day of the week, it's Sunday is known to us. Very early in the morning, they came and he was not there for he had been resurrected. Very clear, conclusive, direct, abundant evidence. Friday, day of preparation, right? Sun sets on Friday night, what is known as Friday night, which would be the Sabbath day. Sabbath, Christ rested in the tomb. And on the first day of the week, Sunday, Christ is resurrected. My loved ones, there is no doubt in regards to what, biblically, no doubt in regards to what day is the Sabbath day. It's the day after Friday and the day before Sunday, amen? That time period, remember, it's a 24-hour time period. It's not, it falls technically, most part of it falls on Saturday, but it's the whole concept of sunset to sunset. Look at Matthew chapter 28, verse 1. It confirms this very clearly. Now, after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the tomb. Again, what does it say? After the Sabbath they had finished, they showed up when? On the first day of the week, which is Sunday, to come. And so I say amen, right? Clarity has been presented. I'm like, very clear to me. No doubt whatsoever what the commandment, what day is the Lord's holy day, the Sabbath day. And I'm saying, I'm going to keep it. Now, when we talk about the Sabbath day, right? 
What was the purpose of the Sabbath day? The purpose of the Sabbath day was a celebration. Let's, let's, put the, let's make an example. Imagine that day after God creates everything for six days, and then he creates Adam, right? Then he, he, le- he waits a little bit so that Adam can see that all of the animals have, have, have couples, right? They have a partner. And so then Adam was born in him the desire to want to have one like himself. Then God does what? He puts him to sleep. And he creates Eve. So you can imagine that first day when Adam creates Eve and Adam opens his eyes and he sees Eve. And he's probably like, "Woo, hello, right? Look at this beautiful, amazing creation that God has given, made for me. And God said, hey, you're one for another. And so right there, God is about to marry them, right? I'm sure they're right excited. She's looking at him. He's looking at her like, wow, look at this. Beautiful, right? And God says, oh, wait a minute. Before I marry you, I want you to understand something. I want you to understand that I created you for each other and everything that I have created here on earth is for you. This is your wedding gift. And you can imagine the face of Adam and Eve. They're like, whoa, what? And so God gives them this beautiful partner. He marries them. And then he tells them this, everything that is on this earth is your wedding gift. I have made this all for you. Amen? And so after he marries Adam and Eve, that first marriage ceremony, what does he do? He takes them on a tour on the Sabbath day. I'm sure, the, I'm sure that when they were marrying, the sun was setting on that Sabbath day, a beautiful sunset right there. And they're probably looking off the river or something on a mountain. And right there, what does God do? It says, now let's go enjoy and I'm going to show you what I have created. I'm going to show you the vastness of my creation. And he takes Adam and Eve on a tour of the world he just gave them as a wedding gift. Now, do you think Adam and Eve were enjoying that time or do you think they were just bored? Like, oh, come on, hurry up. The tour needs to be over with. No, of course not, my loved ones. They're enjoying it, right? They're enjoying not only their own presence, they're enjoying the presence of God. They're enjoying all of the things that God has created for them. And I'm sure that during the, ta- during the tour, Adam is like, oh, this is an elephant and this is a giraffe and this is the, right? And Eve is just like, whoa, you're so smart, my husband, right? God does it for a purpose. And so all of a sudden we're seeing all of these things. They're just enjoying and rejoicing. What is the purpose of the Sabbath day? Is to celebrate and rejoice God through his creation, right? Part of it is to celebrate and enjoy that. Look at what it says in Isaiah chapter 65, verse 18 and 19. But be glad and rejoice forever in that, wi- in that which I have created. For behold, I created Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. God is rejoicing. God is celebrating on the Sabbath day. Not only that we are, that he is our God, but that we are his people, that we are his children. And it's that special quality time that God wants to spend with us. Why? He wants to celebrate that we are his and that he is our God and he has created us. And so this is this special, beautiful time. That's why it says in in Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, remember the Sabbath day. That word remember, right? Sadok in Hebrew. It means, I'm sorry, sakar is the word. To celebrate, to commemorate, to enjoy. That's what the Sabbath day is. The Sabbath day is a weekly celebration, right? And so we take days for during the year to celebrate many things. Some of us take days to celebrate our birthday. Some of us, some people take days to celebrate anniversaries, right? To send a number of things, wedding days. We take days to celebrate all kind of things, right? Even things that don't even don't matter much. My loved ones, if we can do all of that, Independence Days and all of that, do you think God deserves a day of celebration? Yeah, not only a day in a year. He, he, he's given us a weekly celebration. Nowhere else do you find a weekly celebration, a weekly holy convocation that we come together to honor and celebrate that God is our God and that we are his creation. And to that I say, amen, praise the Lord. And so as we look at these things, my loved ones, we see very clearly what the purpose is, why God created it, when God created it, for who did God create it, and all of the questions are answered very clearly in regards to the Sabbath day. Now, here's where it gets a little tricky because the question is, okay, Carlos, very clear what day is the Sabbath day, biblically established, we get it, we see it, but the question is, why is it that so many well-intentioned, sincere Christians, the majority actually of Christians, believe that Sunday is the Lord's day. Where does that come from? It's not found in the Bible. You will not find one single Bible verse that says 
in any way, shape, or form that God has transferred the holiness and the solemnity of the Sabbath day to any other day, much much less the first day of the week. It's not in Scripture. You won't find it anywhere. No verse where God says, I have transferred the solemnity or the holiness of the Sabbath day to the first day of the week. So the question is, why then do most Christians believe that Sunday is the Lord's day? Very simple. Jesus explains it in Matthew chapter 15, 3 forward. Jesus answered that I'm saying, why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. So my loved ones, it's very simple. The reason why most Christians keep Sunday is not because of a biblical explanation, but because of tradition, right? A tradition that was kept and that began, my loved ones, thousands of years ago in Rome. Now, how did this tradition come forth? Very simple. If you know the history of Rome, I'm going to give you a very brief explanation, but you can study this. You can do a Google search and you can find out. There was an emperor known as Constantine. Constantine the Great became emperor of Rome, and the way he became is because he believed that God, he saw a vision of God to conquer Rome, right? He wanted to be the emperor of Rome. He saw this vision of the cross, and he went, and he, and he believed that God, the Christian... Now, this is important because Christianity was being persecuted in the Roman Empire during this time. And so Constantine goes in and he conquers. He becomes the emperor of Rome. And so all of a sudden, now he says, ha ha now this Christian God that helped me become emperor, now I'm going to place him on the, on, the, on the throne with me, right? And so all of a sudden Christianity that came from to be a persecuted religion is now becomes eventually the official religion of the Roman Empire. And what happens, my loved ones, is that in this process, the church sadly became ecstatic, right? Not that he converted, but that now all of a sudden you are going to start to see the coming together of church and state, Right? That, 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 that uh, illicit relationship where the church and the state get mingled together and they, one starts to dominate the other. And so that's exactly what happened. And the reasoning, it wasn't really a bad reason. They, basically what they were saying was, listen, we have all of these pagans and guess what day was the favorite worship day in the Roman Empire? It was Sunday, the day that the sun was worshipped. And so what they said and basically did was, listen, it, well, let, we got to transfer, we got to convert all of, these, all of these pagans into Christianity. And so what they started to do is, instead of trying to convert them through the methods of Scripture, right, through, through coming to know Christ, no. They tried to Christianize the pagans by force. And by doing that, what they ended up doing was paganizing Christianity. And so this practice of Sunday worship then filtered inside of the church. And what happened eventually is they said, you know what? These Jews, they killed Christ. Kick the Jews out and take their Sabbath with them. Uh, the Sabbath was not made for the Jew. The Sabbath was made for humanity. And so that was the big mistake. And that's how this tradition began, my loved ones. And this is a, in, the, in, the 14th, in the 4th century, I'm sorry. You can go do your study. A, a, a Sunday law decree was made. And that's how it all began. And eventually we know, my loved ones, we're going to see that that tradi- tradition crept into the church And that's why most follow it. But God in his word permitting, right? We're going to study further on some of the distortions and the perversions to the word of God that God permitted as this union of church and state came together. But we see that God is also a God that restores and reforms things. And so despite the Sabbath being trampled on, God says in Isaiah chapter 58, verse 13 and 14, that is my holy day. Delight in it, rejoice in it, because I'm going to restore it. And that's what we're doing with Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 and 7. It's saying, worship him as what? As the creator, as the one who made the heavens, the sea, the earth, and all of these things. And so I ask you a question. If God is the one who says that the seventh day of the week, the Sabbath day, is a holy day, who are you and I to say it is not? It says in Numbers chapter 23, verse 20, Behold, I have received the command to bless. He, God, blessed, and I cannot revoke it. My loved ones, if God says that the seventh day is holy, and he knows what is holy because he is the holy one, and he determines, he establishes what is common is what is holy, the question is then, who are we to say, no, the seventh day is no longer God's holy day. We want to call it Sunday or Monday or any day or no day of the week. Could it be that we're then playing God? God is the one that determines. It's not us. 
He is the one who determines right or wrong. That's the problem that had happened in Genesis chapter 3. When the serpent said, you don't need God to tell you what's right or wrong. You can figure it out on your own. And so what we're seeing, my loved ones, is this concept of are we putting ourselves in the place of God when we try to take away the holiness, the sanctity of his seventh day Sabbath. And so we can break this down in so many ways because I know so many people say, oh, they come up with all type of excuses. None, no biblical foundation. You have some verses that are here or there taken out of context, Right. But no, but you do not find anywhere where God says, my take, where Sunday is a holy day, where the Sabbath is no longer holy. Nowhere does Christ and his disciples or the apostles teach that Sunday is the, is the, is the new holy day. It, you will not find it in scripture. And so some people tell me, oh, Carlos, you're making, you're making such a big deal on one day of the week. No, 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 no. I'm not making a big deal on the day of the week. God is. He's the one from the very beginning of creation in Genesis then in the Ten Commandments that says that this day is holy and he has established it. So the question is, who am I to think that it's not? So if I want to recognize and honor God as my creator, then that's what the purpose of the Sabbath day is, is that celebration. Now, I want to be very important. I'm sorry, I want to be very clear. In no way, shape, or form am I saying that the Sabbath day is more important than the other nine commandments, right? No. I'm just, we're just talking about this, the fourth commandment because it happens to be the one that God says, remember, it happens to be the one that almost everybody has forgotten about. My loved ones, the Sabbath day is not more important than the other nine commandments, but on the, con on the, on the contrary, also, the other nine commandments are not more important than the fourth commandment of the Sabbath day. They're all equally important to God and they all point to God's beauty, his glory, his character, who God is in essence. The Ten Commandments are a reflection of his character and so that's why it should be so and so important to us. Many people say, oh, no, 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 Carlos. Christ, bro he broke the Sabbath. Now, we have a major problem with that because we studied in a previous presentation that if Christ broke the Sabbath day, and the Sabbath, the, keeping the Sabbath is part of the Ten Commandments, the Fourth Commandment. And we also learned that in, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, it says that sin is the transgression of the law. And it says it in Romans chapter 3.20, Romans chapter 7, 7, 7. Paul says, I would not have known sin if it were not through the law. So if you're saying that Jesus Christ did broke the Sabbath day, what you're technically saying is that he is a sinner. And if Christ would have been a sinner, then he would have needed a Savior like you and me. My loved ones, the ones that accused Jesus of breaking the Sabbath were the very ones, my loved ones, that were making the burden of the Sabbath. That was the accusation. They accused him of being a drunk. They accused him of, of, of being of the devil. They accused him of a lot of things, my loved ones. But to say that, my loved ones, is, is really, a, it's a heresy. Because Jesus Christ, my loved ones, died for our sins. Remember, the law upholds the cross of Calvary because the cross of Calvary shows us that what the payment of sin is. And so it says in Romans chapter 6, Paul says, wait a minute, now that Christ has died for your sins and now that you have accepted him, are you going to continue to live in sin? And the answer is, of course not. Now I'm not going to say, oh, well, Christ died for my sins. Now I'm going to continue to live the vida loca, right? No, of course not. You're going to want to uphold those principles because at the same time they show us sin, at the same time they show us the righteousness and the justice of God. And so those principles are upholding, especially the fourth commandment. Christ died, pay attention to this, he died because of what? Because we have been transgressing all of the law, especially the Sabbath day. And so what is he trying to teach us? He's saying, yes, the Sabbath day is important and the cross of Calvary proves it and I say praise the Lord now I have people tell me oh I worship every day right oh I worship every day that's one of the popular things I worship every day now don't get me wrong I worship God every day too right worship remember obedience submission every day I read my Bible every day I study I, I pray every day if the church is open every day when when we have some type of special events uh, evangelistic campaigns or weeks of prayer we go to church every day right that's not the issue the issue is that God has said, this seventh day is my Sabbath day. It actually says in Acts chapter 2, on verse uh, 41, 46, it said that they would go to the church every day, right? They were meeting and gathering and breaking bread together every day. That means that the church was hanging out every day. They were eating together every day. They were having communion every day. But there was something different about the Sabbath day. And you find in the book of Acts and throughout Scripture that both Jesus and the disciples, they all upheld, they all kept the Sabbath day holy. And I say to that, 
Amen. People say, well, was it, hasn't the calendar been changed? No, nope. in any way, shape, or form, right? The calendar has not been changed. Now, don't get me wrong. The dates have been changed, right? But the weekly calendar, the, se the seven-day week cycle has never been changed. The last time that the calendar was changed, I believe, was 1582. It's the Gregorian calendar, right? It's known as that. And if you look at that Gregorian calendar in 1582 in October, they went and they changed the dates, but not the seven-day cycle. You will find no evidence whatsoever that the seven-day cycle has ever been changed. They tried to do it in France and after the French Revolution, during the French Revolution, and that was a big mess, right? And so they had to go back to the seven-day cycle. And again, where do we get the seven-day cycle? There, there's no scientific explanation to it like a day or an hour or a week or a year, I'm sorry, a year or a month, but the seven-day cycle, where does it come from? There's only one historical account to where we can justify the seven-day cycle, and that is in the Bible. And I say, praise the Lord for that. Some people say, oh, Carlos, but the majority go to Sunday. How can you know, right? The scholars and, and, and those that have PhDs and those have been for centuries, right? They all kept, they all kept Sunday. You're going to tell me you? are right and, I, and they're wrong? I'm like, no, I'm not telling you that I'm right and they're wrong. What I'm telling you is that you should not be following what people say or believe or their titles. You should be following Scripture. And Scripture says that, it's not, that Sunday is not the Lord's Day. Not me. The Bible says it. So don't go by titles. Don't go by, don't get impressed with, with, flat, with people's uh, nice, uh, eloquent speeches and all these things. They sound nice, but at the end of the day, what does the Bible say? Remember, my loved ones, don't go by the majority because the majority killed Christ during his times. And they were all Sabbath keepers. So remember, it's not just about the Sabbath. It's about the God of the Sabbath. It's about the one that created the Sabbath day. And so people say, oh, but didn't, didn't the disciples trample on the Sabbath day? Oh, no, in no way, shape, or form, my loved ones. And I'll just give you one example. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 19, it says, Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, Paul says, but keeping the commandments of God is what matters. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, we talked about it. It says, the dragon is making war on the woman. Why? Because she keeps the commandment of God. She's making war on the church. And she has a what? The testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 14 verse 12. It says here is the perseverance of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and do what? And have the testimony of Jesus Christ. My loved ones, we can go through this all day long. And there is absolutely no evidence. And some people say, well, wait a minute. Are you telling me that everybody in the past that never kept the Sabbath day is not going to go to heaven? I did not say that. We talked about judgment already, and God is a fair judge, and God will judge everybody based on what they knew and how they lived according to that knowledge. So you do not have to worry and fear about those that are not aware of these things. They were faithful based on what they knew. And it says this in Acts chapter 17, verse 30. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to what? To repent. To repent from what? From sin. So we may not have been aware of it, but now we are aware of it, and so... If you're listening to me, you're not dead, right? You're alive, and we're very conscious of what we're doing. And so God is revealing this truth to you. So my invitation is for you to continue to study it. Look for it. You do the evidence yourself, my loved ones, because I don't know about you, but I'm not going to go to heaven based on any of my merits and based on the merits of Jesus Christ. But the evidence that I to be presented that I have accepted Christ is that I am obeying, I am following. He is not only my Savior, He is my Lord, my King, my Ruler. And so that, my loved ones, should put us to want to say, I want to live by what the Word of God says, especially the Ten Commandments, my loved ones. Some people say, well, I work on the Sabbath day. Well, that's true. God doesn't, want me to God doesn't want me to work. He doesn't want me to feed my family. No, that's not what the Bible says. God says you have six days to do everything that you need, but the seventh day is my day. Put me first, right? And it says this very clearly in Psalms 37, 25. I have been young and now I am old, yet I have not seen the righteous or the just forsaken, nor his descendants begging for bread. In other words, you put God first in your life, and God promises to supply everything we need. That's what it says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. He says what? In, in the context, he says, you don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear. That's what the Gentiles and the pagans worry about. He says, I am your God. And he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and I shall give all things to you. So we should be seeking first to live by the word of God, to live and hold up these principles, my loved ones. And that's how, my loved ones, we show. That's the evidence that our heart is being converted, transformed, and have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, watch 
I want to share you something very interesting. Sabbath was established in creation. God's people kept it during the whole time of the Hebrew Scriptures. Christ kept the Sabbath day. The, uh, the early church says in the book of Acts, kept the Sabbath day. J Paul upheld the, the commandments. John upheld the commandments. Peter upheld the commandments. And look at what it says here in Isaiah chapter 66, verse 22 and 23. This is talking about the new heavens and the new earth. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, and from Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh shall come worship before me. Woo. What does God say in Isaiah chapter 66, verse 22 and 23? He's saying, in the new heavens and the new earth, which has not happened yet because that is in the future, that is after the problem of sin shall be solved. That's Revelation chapter 21 and 22. God says, I'm going to make a new heavens and a new earth. And in that new heavens and the new earth, he's saying, you know what? Every Sabbath day, we're going to come together and celebrate for the rest of eternity that I am your God and that you are my creation. So Sabbath has always been kept all the way to Jesus, from the beginning to Jesus, to the disciples. For the rest of eternity, the Sabbath is going to be kept, but somehow now it's not important and we can just forget about it and let that one slide. I'm sorry, that's not acceptable. That's not reasonable, biblically sounding, my loved ones. Jesus says very clearly in John chapter 14, verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Two points. If, that means if you have accepted me, if you love me, the evidence to that is that you're doing what? That you're keeping my commandments. And he's saying, if you love me, keep my commandments. That means I'm going to give you the power to keep them. Remember, the Ten Commandments are ten promises that God says he is going to help through the power of the Holy Spirit, it's with our desire to say, yes, Lord, help me. I want to be faithful to you. I want to live by your principles. And the power of the Holy Spirit gives us that power so that we can live by it. Amen? And so, my loved ones, I know this is a, could be a very uncomfortable topic for a lot of people. I was, For me, I'll tell you the truth, I was not raised Christians. And when I come to the Bible, I used to keep Sunday, right? I thought Sunday was a day because that's what everybody else was doing. But when I was presented the Sabbath truth and I look in Scripture... I was very clear, my loved ones, there is no evidence to any day other than the seventh day Sabbath being God's day. And when Jesus tells me, Carlos, if you love me, keep my commandments. I said, Christ, I love you and I want to be faithful and loyal to you and I want to keep your commandments. And so my invitation to you today is this. If you say you love Christ, if you say you love his word, if you say you want to live by his word and he is your savior and he is your Lord, then I invite you also to say, I want to start keeping the Sabbath day as Christ did, right? Anything that Christ did is safe for us to follow because we know that Christ lived perfectly according to the word of God. And so we're invited to say, live like him. He is our example. He is our model. He is who we are to follow. We don't keep it based on our own strength and our own merits. We keep it based on the merits of Christ and based on the strength that he has given us through the power of the Holy Spirit to be obedient, to be faithful, and to follow his word. And so I hope even maybe you're struggling with this topic, study it more. Go ahead. I invite you, and you'll see this truth. But I invite you also to say, God, I want to be faithful, and I want to keep your Sabbath day out of love. Amen. <laughs>